right, so um, where is this list? Oh, yeah, this is fine. Good. So um, I guess um, our work is a complete change of, of level from what's gone before. I won't be uh, showing you any pictures of the uh, Great Barrier Reef you know, aerial shots or, or whatever. We, we're start we also want to start to understand how processes like climate change will affect um, the coral reefs but we're really starting at the bottom. We really want to understand the basis of calcification and other complex processes in corals, starting with the genome and the processes themselves. So we're at the opposite end of the scale. I need to acknowledge at the outset the uh, support that we've had, just in case I've cut you off. Um, um, this, this work that I'm going to talk about has um, largely recently been funded through the um, ARC Center of Excellence, um, previously through the Center for the Molecular Genetics of Development and Discovery Projects to myself and others. Um, and recently um, we've had uh, support from the Australian Genome Research Facility and the Illumina. Moreover, um, the, I, I need to make it clear that the coral genomics projects um, evolved from a long-term collaboration between my lab and Eldon Balls at the Australian National University. So I'm speaking on behalf of the Coral Consortium, um, which is now um, largely housed and funded within the Centre of Excellence, but, but which also includes Eldon's lab at ANU. And I get asked a lot why we need a coral genome project um, and I want to use this opportunity to kind of justify uh, a coral genome project to an audience which is largely um, ecologically orientated, management orientated. Why do we need a coral genome? Well, I think the simplest answer is that because without one, we simply cannot really uh, begin to understand fully um, complex coral characteristics, such as how you build a skeleton. So skeletogenesis is a, a defining character of, of sclerotinian corals, building massive calcium carbonate skeletons. It's not the only complex characteristic of corals that we can't begin to understand fully until we have a genome sequence. Simple as that. So as I said, skeletons define sclerotinian, more or less. Um, but although corals, which are Liberians, are perhaps the most spectacular recent uh, massive calcifying organism, um, calcification, massive calcification occurs in many lineages, many phyla, including sponges, mollusks, echinoderms, and chordates. However, it's pretty well accepted that calcifications evolved independently on multiple occasions. It isn't that the ancestor calcified, it's that um, we've invented this trick on multiple occasions during animal evolution. And even within the Cnidaria, the phylum to which corals belong, sclerotinian corals belong, massive calcification, reef building calcifications occurred at least three times during the evolutionary history. So sclerotinians proper um, have a fossil record that goes back somewhere into the mid-Triassic. Um, before them, however, reefs were constructed by rugose and tabulate corals, which had separate origins from sclerotinians. So, I mean, the take-home message for me as a biologist here is that it seems to be an easy trick to accomplish, particularly if you're a Cnidarian. You can make a skeleton without really requiring very much. There are some chemical constraints on the process. You know, you're always going to need to do certain kinds of chemistry to achieve calcium carbonate deposition. And that means that we can predict some of the toolkit that's going to be required. We can uh, predict that carbonic anhydrases and the calcium regulatory apparatus, calmodulins, calcium sensors, will always be required for calcification. But um, calcification occurs in the context of an organic matrix, and this is where the specificity comes. This is where it gets complicated, because 
the independent origins of skeletons mean that um, the proteins that, are, that constitute the matrix um, are going to have been recruited relatively recently. And that means there's no way of predicting them um, from the start. We have to go look. Excellent, excellent. Um, my Macintosh produced slides are now not going to give you pictures. So an example of, of um, a part of the conserved apparatus is uh, carbonic anhydrases. Um, carbonic anhydrases will always be required to enable massive calcification. Um, they're required in sponges and so on. And it's, it's nice to see that um, in corals too, um, carbonic anhydrase is localized to the chloroplastic ectoderm. Here stained in yellow are carbonic anhydrases um, localizing to the tissue which is bringing about calcification. I should say this is um, some beautiful recent work from Aureli Moya um, who may, may be here sometime. Um, but equally there'll be parts of the calcification process which are unique. The, the matrix which controls deposition um, and you would be seeing this if this was Macintosh. Um, the matrix which controls calcium carbonate deposition um, is going to be unique to corals. The matrix is secreted by the colliculoblastic ectoderm, a specialized tissue, and consists of protein, carbohydrate, and lipid. Um, and it, it does the, the business end of calcification in that it nucleates calcium carbonate crystals and controls the, the detail of crystal morphology and crystal growth. Moreover, it, it determines the kind of polymorph of calcium carbonate, predominantly aragonite in adult corals, um, but there's evidence that calcite is also important in the uh, primordial skeleton. Okay, so that's the context and justification for, for uh, a genome project. Um, we have focused on Acropia millipora as a model coral, um, and I think it's become uh, generally accepted as the model coral. Biology is, has made great inroads by adopting the model organism principle whereby you get to know one species um, within a phylum really quite well and then you build outwards by comparison with that one organism. It's taken a while for the coral community to adopt this kind of thinking um, but I think um, now there's a general feeling that we do need a model coral and uh, Acropia millipora is, is the best candidate. We, worked, uh, we began to work on this organism some time back um, because, or pragmatically, um, because it's a member, of, first of all, of, a, of the dominant genus in the Indo-Pacific. Um, Acropias are fast-growing, relatively common on the GBR, and uh, this particular species can be unambiguously identified most of the time. It also spawns predictably, reasonably predictably, and in reasonably am reasonable amounts at a convenient time. So pragmatically, it's our organism of choice. And some time back, we began a um, uh, poor man's genome project um, on um, this particular coral. Um, so this was about eight years ago, and we had no alternative at that time. The costs of full genome sequencing were really prohibitive. So we did the next best thing. We began to sequence expressed genes at random. So ESTs, express sequence tags, genes sequenced at random. Um, and the work that we've done to date and much of the work um, on this, uh, genomic work on this coral is done by others is based on a set of about 8,000, 8,500 genes. We now have many more genes. We think we have near the full transcriptome, the full set of genes, but these data are still in the minority. So the EST project gave us about 8,000 genes. And if you compare these genes with um, those in the databases, all of the data for other animals, um, you can see that maybe 42%, approximately 42% um, are shared with other animals. 
And amongst this 42% are uh, many of the usual suspects. Um, carbonic anhydrases, calmodulins, which the conserved component of calcification is delivered by the conserved genes amongst the gene set. But the proteins which make the matrix are going to be in, in here, in the coral-specific component. And we have no um, de novo way of, or no uh, a priori way of predicting those. So to, to um, begin to implicate some of those genes in calcification, um, we had to use um, microarray technology to essentially demonstrate that genes are expressed at the right time for a role in calcification. So microarrays are a way of, of comparing gene expression of a large number of genes, 8,000 in this case, and um, we were comparing expression of all these 8,000 genes during the period, the settlement period during which skeleton secretion begins. Um, when we found candidate genes in this way, we've subjected them to in-situ hybridization to localize them in space as well as time. What we would want to see of genes involved in calcification is to, to see them expressed in the, uh, the regions which are responsible for calcification, in the uh, uh, colicoblastic ectoderm, in, in the, the region of the forming mesenchyme. So this is what we would like to see. Um, this is where we would like to see expression of genes involved in calcification. And we're comparing expression through the, the metamorphosis early stages of calcification stages. Use microarrays to do this. This is the first generation of coral microarrays, just to show you what they look like. Um, the genes are essentially spotted on glass and then hybridized simultaneously to two different stages uh, a calcifying stage and a non calcifying stage. And in this case, um, the, the reds, which appear pink, um, are genes which are up regulated, and green is down regulated. And then data were presented as heat maps, analyzed as, as these heat maps where, in this case, yellow is up and blue is down. Um, bars represent individual genes, and genes are clustered uh, by um, the time window in which they're expressed. So these kinds of analyses implicate a cluster of genes in the early post-settlement stage and a separate cluster of genes in in the adult stage. And from these kinds of analyses, we were able to find genes um, known as galaxins. Galaxins are unique to corals. You could not have predicted them based on um, comparison with the database. We have uh, at least three galaxins. Um, galaxin one has uh, these, these genes encode proteins, all of which have a, a cysteine-rich region a signal peptide. Two and three are larger proteins containing also an acidic domain. So we think these proteins have roles in controlling um, the deposition of calcium carbonate. And we think this acidic domain um, is also important in um, controlling or inhibiting the process partially in controlling the early stages of calcification. These genes are expressed in the right place at the right time for those roles which we've proposed. So if you look at the um, settling, if you look at the settling um, planula, it's expressing galaxin 2 in the region which is um, going to form the primordial skeleton. Galaxin 1 is expressed later, it's expressed in the post-settlement period in exactly the right place for roles in calcification. So remember what we were looking for was expression in the, the developing mesentery. And this is pretty much what you see in the case of galaxin 1. So the galaxins are in the right place at the right times for roles in building the skeleton. They're one, um, one family of genes which is unique to corals, um, likely component of the matrix, which um, one could not have predicted without 
first, uh, a poor man's genome project, and then second, um, microarray analysis to identify the, the genes in the right time window. Another family of coral-specific genes identified in a similar way are the scripts, small cysteine-rich proteins, um, identified by Sunny Shimagawa, Sunny Sumagawa in Monica Medina's lab. This again is a family of coral-specific genes. They're expressed, some of which are expressed in the right place at the right time for roles in calcification. So if we go back to this, this um, breakdown of, of the, the 8,000 or so genes um, that we've identified to date, um, now, as well as the usual suspects, the, the proteins, the genes encoding proteins um, involved in the conserved side of, of calcification, we can add in some um, coral-specific genes, galaxins and scripts, and a number of other genes that don't have elegant and catchy names, um, which are also um, likely to have roles in calcification in, in the matrix itself. So I hope I've justified to some extent the, the um, genomic work that we've done to date. Um, the EST project's found about 8,000 genes um, so far. Um, next generation sequencing is delivering many more genes. We think there's about 20,000 genes all up. And I have to say this is uh, largely down to the, the work of two um, outstanding scientists, Dave Hayward at the Australian National University and Sylvain Foray who's recently joined us um, in the Coral Centre at James Cook. Where to next? Well, we've, we've, um, we're fortunate in um, having recently been approached by the Australian Genome Research Facility to um, uh, have the whole genome sequenced under Koko Milikora. Um, this will be the, this is something of a coup in that it will be the first fully homegrown animal genome project in that um, the AGRF will do the sequencing in Brisbane with support from Illumina and the genome sequence will be assembled by an all Australian consortium um, consisting of, but not exclusively, scientists from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, University of Queensland and um, the Centre of Excellence at James Cook. This uh, is important because it will yield not just the genes, um, not just the full set of coral genes, but tell us about their organization and potentially how all of those genes interact with each other and are regulated. So it really will be um, enormously beneficial, I think, to, to all aspects and enormously informative to um, many parts of the coral biology community. In particular, it will enable us to do a comprehensive comparison of the coral gene set um, with those of other animals. Um, the most interesting comparison, I think, will be with the sea anemone pneumaticella, for which there's also a, a whole genome sequence recently published. Sea anemones and corals are pretty close, um, and this comparison should give us um, further insights into what makes corals different, skeletons, symbiosis, and so on. And um, we should be in a position to address how the whole genome responds to stress and disease. Beyond all of this, um, as, as Betty indicated, there's a real need to begin to understand the whole system. This will enable us to know the coral pretty well, but Corals on reefs consist of coral animal, algal symbionts, or um, zooxanthellae symbionts, um, and uh, bacterial community, as Betty, Betty alluded to. So um, there's a real need to not only sequence the coral genome, but also get as much data um, on the symbionts as possible. And this is, um, there would be a nice picture of Bill Leggett here. Um, Oh, there he is. That's, that's good. That's good. Um, and this is um, work that um, Bill Leggett 
um, has been pioneering. Um, the, the genomes of the symbionts are um, very large and very complicated, more complex probably than the human genome, essentially intractable at this time. Um, but there is a, um, a real likelihood that um, an extensive um, poor man's genome project, an extensive EST project, which has already started, um, will run in earnest in the next few years. So with, with a bunch of data for the, the, the coral host, um, a comprehensive picture of the, this transcriptome, the expressed genes in the symbiont, and some data for the um, microbial association, we should be in a much better position to come to grips with complex coral processes, such as how corals build skeletons and what goes wrong um, under stress and disease. All right, thank you.